Let me tell you a little bit about prophecy in the news this week. First article up is underneath the New World Order, and this is one that's kind of interesting. It's flowing right along the line of what we've been talking about. The five-year countdown to bring about global digital ID and digital currency. So we've been talking about this for quite a few months now, and it's getting closer and closer. And it really, although it's technical, we really need to listen to what it's doing because it's fitting right into prophecy. So dozens of national governments are joining with the United Nations and billionaire population control fanatic Bill Gates on a global program to impose, quote, digital public infrastructure, it's called DPI, on, the, on their citizens within five years. The new scheme unveiled last year and moving ahead very rapidly is known as 50 in 5 because 50 governments expect to have the Orwellian in digital infrastructure of tyranny in place within five years. The UN's assumption is that every government on the planet will eventually impose this on every person on earth. The whole program is being guided by the UN and elitists, including Gates and others such as the Rockefellers, longtime financiers of globalism in eugenics and population control schemes. But the US and European taxpayers are being conscripted to foot much of the bill via the UN agencies and international development banks. If not stopped, critics say, the new, the new suit of digital public, public goods and infrastructure will create a technological panop panopticon, panopticon, allowing for, I know it's a new word for everybody, allowing for total surveillance and control of all people everywhere on the planet. Indeed, as the 2030 agenda makes it clear, no one will be left behind. Once in full swing, literally every transaction that you have or I have or anyone on the planet has would be tracked, monitored, and controlled. And please note, this is the implementation of the mark of the beast. This is it. It has to be global. It has to be with every government. It has to be with every transaction. Never in the history of mankind did we have control like this, and we are ramping right up to it. So already, virtually all national governments and central banks around the world are working on central bank digital currencies. You've heard me talk about CBDCs. They're helping to guide and coordinate the rolling out of such currencies worldwide. As cash is sidelined and then disappears, you hear me right, CBDCs will create a permanent record of all transactions. I've said this before, one of my predictions is look for the fact that the United States will start controlling and taking off the market big bills, like the $100 bill. It's an incremental way to get us to a cashless society. Then it'll be 50s, and then obviously they'll offer CBDCs for trading of fiat currency. So ultimately, the digital IDs and CBDs will become inseparable. You'll have to have a digital ID also, which is very close to becoming worldwide. What CBD's research and experimentation appears to be showing is that it will be impossible to issue such currencies outside of a comprehensive national digital ID management system. So they have to go hand in hand. Now, <clears throat> hear this. Normal national ID is another name for the mark of the beast. You can't buy or sell. You have to identify yourself. You have to have a national identity, a worldwide identity. So eventually, healthcare will become entwined with all of it and may precipitate the, inst the institution of it worldwide. The WHO, the World Health Organization, is now using EU system, European Union system, to design a similar regime for all of humanity. So the potential for control is almost endless. If successful, DPI, digital public uh, digital public infrastructure will give governments and corporations the power to implement systems of social credit that can determine where and how you can travel, what you are allowed to consume, buy and sell, and how you'll be able to transact with your programmable money, CBDCs. This sort of system already exists in communist China. And so it's only a matter of time before such a, re a regime is eventually unveiled in the West with massive Opposition, yes, there'll be opposition. But the 50 and 5 campaign for DPI officially was launched last year in New York. It aims to radically shorten, quote unquote, the length of time that it would take to digitize everything from identification to currency. The first governments to jump on the bandwagon so far, most with promises of free money extracted from the Western taxpayers, you and I, include Bangladesh, they're already on board, Ethiopia, Guatemala, Moldova, Senegal, Sierra Leone, Sri Lanka, and Togo, and a handful of wealthier countries and governments, including those in Norway and Singapore, have also signed on. Then each government eventually 
will share what it learned with other governments so that digital surveillance and control architecture can be imposed faster in a way that transcends national borders. This is right in line with the mark of the beast, putting everything together, an identity of every person on the planet in, in, in coordination with digital control of their money. So you can't get any closer to the mark of the beast than that. Let me go a little bit further for you and tell you a little bit about Israel. And man, it is heating up in Israel. There's been, there's been skirmishes in Israel for years and years since it's become a nation in 1948. But I have never seen anything like this and I've never seen anything closer to World War III. And I don't want to scare anyone, but I want to tell you this is what's going on. This article, unprecedented. Members of Congress slam Biden's ultimatum to Israel. That's right, uh, Biden, who is really a non-producer of anything really worthwhile, has given an ultimatum to Israel. This is unheard of. Uh, members of Congress denounced the ultimatum that U.S. President Joe Biden gave to Israel Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu during a Thursday phone call. Um, make exchange, make changes, he's what he said, make changes that Washington has called for or face the prospect of U.S. policy changes. In other words, we're not going to fund you, give you any arm, armaments, give you any weapons, and really leave you alone. Now, just listen to it. Representative Tom Cole, a Republican from Oklahoma, noted that an offensive speech last month by Senator, Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer calling Netanyahu an obstacle to peace and calling for early Israel, Israeli elections. They're trying to oust them. I told you last week, there's a four-point four, four plan in the White House to oust Benjamin Netanyahu. Now, many Democrats have a serious anti-Israel problem, Cole stated. The congressman called for Biden's ultimatum to Netanyahu, unacceptable. The recent actions and statements of both Senator Schumer and President Biden with respect to Israel are both outrageous and inappropriate, he said. House Majority Leader Steve Scalise, Republican for Louisiana, said the United States must stand unequivocally with our greatest ally in the Middle East, Israel. Representative Dan Crenshaw from Texas stated that know-nothing activists who think uh, that a transgender flag and a Hamas flag go well together have unfortunately infiltrated Biden's thinking. Let's put the idea of a ceasefire into perspective, he said. You want Israel to stop fighting against an enemy that has no intention of ever stopping in fighting. You know when there was a ceasefire? October 6th, he said. You know what happened on October 7th? The ceasefire ended with the massacre. War is always ugly, but the blood of every civil, civilian death is on Hamas, not Israel. He added, the demand should be simple. Hamas must surrender totally and completely and allow, allow a transition of power. Hamas can never have power again. If you care about Palestinian lives, this is what must happen, he said. Representative Ann Wagner of Mon Montana said that Joe Biden is about to abandon Israel the same way he abandoned Afghanistan. He is caving to the Hamas sympathizers who have taken over the Democratic Party and given up our strongest ally in the Middle East. His announcement could destabilize the region and embolden Iran. And that's exactly what it's done. This came out today. And you talk about an emboldening Iran. Israel threatens to strike Iran directly if Iran launches an attack from its territories. There's been a lot of rhetoric going back and forth. Israel's foreign minister threatened Wednesday uh, that his country's forces would strike Iran directly if the Islamic Republic launched an attack from its territory against Israel. As tensions between the rival powers flare following the killing of Iranian generals in a blast at the Iranian consulate in Syria. If Iran attacks from its territory, Israel will respond and attack in Iran, Israel Katz said in a post on X in both Farsi and in Hebrew language. The remark came after Iran's supreme leader Ayatollah Ali Khomeini reiterated early Wednesday a promise to retaliate against Israel over the attacks on its consulate in Damascus earlier this month. Khamenei spoke at a prayer ceremony celebrating the end of the Muslim holy month of Ramadan. Among 12 killed in the blast on April 1st were seven Iranian uh, Revolutionary Guard members, four Syrians and a Hezbollah militia member. Khamenei also cri criticized the West, in particular the United States and Britain, for supporting Israel in its war against Hamas in Gaza. This could be World War III. Would it be limited nuclear? You know what Albert Einstein said? He said, I don't know what weapons will be used in World War III, but in World War IV, it'll be sticks and stones. In other words, total annihilation. I'll have to go a little bit further, maybe some good news in religion. <clears throat> These surveys came out this week. 
Research bears out the Bible's commandments on sex, marriage, and happiness. American culture is built to sabotage happiness, from comparing physical appearance on dating apps to encouraging endless obsession over past wrongs to doom scrolling on social media. U.S. culture bombards young people with messages that seem to undermine their present and future happiness. Nowhere is this more apparent than where sex is concerned, where years of social science research proves the happiest people follow the wisdom laid out in the Bible. While Christians do not follow Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior for the purpose of having a better sex life, and there are far more important elements to marriage than physical intimacy, survey after survey consistently show the highest level of sexual satisfaction for those who follow three scriptural injunctions. Number one, wait until marriage to have sex. Couples who waited to have sex until marriage reported 18% uh, higher sexual quality than couples who had sex when they in the first month of dating, according to studies of 2035 married people published in the Journal of Family, Psych Family Psychology. Number two, have no other sexual partners besides your husband and wife. The culture leads people to believe that marital sex with one partner leads to boredom. A porn-soaked culture emphasizes trying a number of different individuals for comparison's sake. Variety for, far from the spice of life is the seed of unhappiness, uh, this research claims. The higher the number of sexual partners the study finds, the lower someone's sexual satisfaction. Number three, attend church together as a couple. American culture puts a low premium on faith, lower still when it comes to the importance of religion in marriage. Few believe it makes much difference what religion someone belongs to because love will eventually overcome it all. But survey after survey shows the happiest, the most sexually fulfilled couples spend time in the same sanctuary. Three quarters of married men, 75%, and women, 74%, who regularly attend church together report being very happy with their sex lives. Physical pleasure is far from the only reason that the Apostle Paul warned Christians, do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers, 2 Corinthians 6, 13 to 15. Yet the truth of scripture applies equally to soul and body. Let's go a little bit further and tell you a little bit right down to planet Earth. Obviously, the eclipse has happened. And interestingly, we were talking Shad and I were talking this week that very that a whole lot less people saw it because of the overcast. I saw a great deal of it, but a lot less people saw it. And if it's a sign, it's almost a sign also that not that many people saw it because it's been overcast in some of the areas where the uh, where the main uh, totality was. It kind of reminds us that it might be that people are ignoring the sign that God has given. Other people thought that something huge was going to happen. So let me just give you what's really going on. And I think it's really important for us to understand this. Signs of the times, pestilences and earthquakes. As a matter of fact, I think I want to do something first before I do that one. And I just want to flip here so I can get, get it for you and you can see it. So the Great American Eclipse, let's talk about that first, which I've been telling you about. So it came and it went and nothing happened. Well, not necessarily so. What will happen or can happen didn't have to occur when the eclipse occurred. I told you before, the eclipse is a sign, not of a specific date and something happening on that specific date, but rather of an upcoming event. So listen to this. Who really, oh, excuse me, will history repeat itself? The last time two eclipses formed a giant X over the United States. Could it be possible that history is about to repeat itself? On April 8th, the great American eclipse trekked across the US making a giant X over America. You've seen me teach this and tell about it before. The eclipse of 2017 started it. Meanwhile, the Devil Comet, which I've told you about, was racing, is racing through our solar system for the first time in 71 years. Most of you already know this, we've already talked about it, but what's not really known and widely known, what I've not told you and waited to tell you, is that we have seen this same pattern before. In 1811, a solar eclipse finished a giant X over the heartland of America that a solar eclipse in 1806 had already started. And meanwhile, Tecumseh Comet was making headlines all over the nation as it raced through the heavens. So this is very, very important. I waited to tell you all this because I knew the eclipse was coming and I knew that this was relative to it. But I want you to understand what happened that first time. And the headlines were talking about this comet also. Approximately three months after the giant X uh, 
over America was completed, cataclysmic earthquakes began erupting along the New Madrid fault line. Is this coincidence that we've had another X and another comet coming? I don't think so. Now watch. A lot of you are not familiar with this, and so let me take it a step at a time. A remarkable total solar eclipse across the entire continent, the continental United States, from the west coast to the east coast on June 16, 1806. The second half was formed by the path of a ring of fire solar eclipse that took place on September 17, 1811. This eclipse was so widely anticipated that even Thomas Jefferson wrote about it. On September 17, he diligently recorded his observations in his weather journal when the moon first contacted the sun, when the annulus, which is ring-shaped, formed, and when the annulus broke, and when the contact ended. According to Jefferson's observations, the entire event lasted three hours, 15 minutes, and 34 seconds. The paths of those two eclipses intersected in the vicinity of Cleveland, Ohio. In 1806 and 1811, these eclipses crossed Cleveland, which was founded in 1796. In, in, it, it, it's not a, a uh, it, it came in a heptech, excuse me, a hepton cross that looks just like that. That's a hepton cross. You can see it just like that. So approximately three months after the eclipse of 1811 completed that giant X over America, the New Madrid fault zone began to go absolutely crazy. The New Madrid earthquakes were the biggest earthquakes in American history. They occurred in the central Mississippi Valley, but were felt as far away as New York City, Boston, Montreal, and Washington, D.C. President James Madison and his wife Dolly felt them in the White House. Church bells rang in Boston from December 16, 1811 through March of 1812. There were over 2,000 earthquakes in the central Midwest and between 6,800 and 10,000 earthquakes in Boot Heel of Missouri, where the New Madrid uh, fault line is located near the junction of the Ohio and the Mississippi rivers. In the known history of the world, no other earthquakes have lasted so long or produced so much evidence of damage as the New Madrid earthquakes. According to the USGS, at one point the geography of the region became so distorted by seismic activity that the Mississippi River actually began to flow backwards temporarily. The New Madrid seismic zone generated a sequence of earthquakes that lasted for several months. The three largest earthquakes in 1811 and 1812 destroyed several settlements along the Mississippi River, caused minor structural damage as far away as Cincinnati, Ohio, St. Louis, Missouri, and were felt as far away as Hartford, Connecticut, and Charleston, South Carolina, and New Orleans, Louisiana. In the New Madrid region, the earthquake dramatically affected the landscape. They caused bank failures along the Mississippi River, landslides along the Chickasaw Bluffs in Kentucky and Tennessee, and uplifts of subs subsidence of large tracts of lands in the Mississippi River floodplain. In addition, the earthquakes liquefied surface, subsurface sediment over a large area and at great distances resulting in ground fissuring and violent venting of water sediment. Um, uh, Prescott Bayou blew up for the distance of nearly 50 miles. These earthquakes opened up enormous fissures in the ground. Some of them went up to, were up to five miles long, and most of the crevices ran from north to the south. One earth, the earthquakes were preceded by an appearance of a great comet, which was visible around the globe for 17 months. The comet, with an orbit of 3,065 years, that's how long it takes to come to a, across uh, our planet, was last seen their their, during the times of Ramses II of Egypt. Here in 2024, the Devil Comet has made a spectacular appearance just before the Great American e Eclipse of 2024, finished the giant X over America that the Great American Eclipse of 2017 started. For, for a lot of people, the Great American Eclipse of 2024 this past, this past week was a wonderful opportunity to just party. As the most ominous sign of the entire history of our country passes over our heads, they were celebrating. But the last time we saw this giant X over the heartland of America, it certainly was, wasn't anything to celebrate. Scientists are telling us that it's just a matter of time before cataclysmic earthquakes erupt along the New Madrid fault zone once again. And when that time arrives, the death and destruction that we will witness will be off the charts. So let me tell you that it isn't over until it's over. Let me give you one more thing when it comes to earthquakes. There will be great earthquakes, famines, and pestilence in various places, and fearful events and great signs from the heaven. Luke 21.11 tells us, 
as of prophecy in the last days. So we're living in an, in an era of endless disasters. Over the past several years, we have been hit with one thing after another, and the pace of events seems to have been picked up uh, a bit, a lot, in 2024. Just think of all the things we have seen in just recent days. There was the historic terror attack in Russia. Then the Francis Scott Key Bridge in Baltimore collapsed. And then Israel's strike on a building right next to Iran's embassy in Damascus threatened to spark a major regional war. Less than 24 hours ago, a catastrophic earthquake hit Taiwan. But that's already starting to fade from the news cycle, if it's even in there, because so much else is happening right now. And here it is, the bird flu plague has already killed millions upon millions of birds all over the planet, but now it has made a major resurgence in the United States. And unfortunately, in our sanitized news and our news medias, you have not heard a single thing about this, but it's a massive threat to America. In fact, the largest egg producer in the United States is temporarily closing a facility in Texas due to a local outbreak. After highly pathogenic avian influenza, otherwise known as H5N1 bird flu, you've heard of that before, wiped out nearly two million birds. Calmaine Foods, just like that, nearly two million birds were gone. Egg prices have already been spiking and we're, we're being warned that they will soon go up even more. Egg prices have now been steadily rising for months. The average price of a dozen grade A large eggs was $3 in February. Today, and that's up by the way, to $2 just, just a month before. Uh, alarmingly, this time around isn't just birds that are catching the disease and this is what's really frightening. Bird flu has been confirmed in dairy cows across several states. That means it's jumped from birds to mammals. Now, just listen. It has been found in New Mexico and in herds in Texas. In addition, we've learned that three pet cats in Texas have died after catching bird flu. As fears are raised that infected animals living near humans could spread the disease to people. This is unprecedented. Bird flu has never, it's only been in birds. So mammals are all over the globe have started to get infected. But up till now, the bird flu has not posed a serious threat to humans. And the question is, is that about to change? A dairy worker in Texas has tested positive now for H5N1. That's the first human to contact bird flu, which by the way, is extremely deadly. The infection, only the second case, excuse me, the second case in history happened also. Every recorded in the country is worrying public health experts who for decades have uh, cautioned that avian flu could possess a serious threat to humans. But the CDC is telling us that testing has shown that H5N1 has mutated into a form that could potentially spread more easily among people. This is a bombshell of news. If H5N1 starts spreading from person to person on a widespread basis, that'll be far more serious than anything we've experienced over the last several years, including the COVID outbreak. Meanwhile, the number of confirmed cases of dengue fever in Brazil is also peaking. It's just exceeded 1.5 million. As a nation, it battles an epidemic that is straining resources and spreading well beyond the areas traditionally affected. Um, more than 1.5 million people have already caught the virus, also known as breakbone fever this year. Remember what Jesus said? There'll be pestilences in, in uh, diverse places. They have never seen anything like this, even close to this. So let me switch gears and talk about earthquakes for a bit. Less than 24 hours ago, we witnessed the worst earthquake in Taiwan history, in, excuse me, in the last 25 years in Taiwan. A 7.4 magnitude tremor struck the island's eastern coast collapsing buildings, killing people, and triggering tsunami warnings across the region that were lifted later on. CNN reports that. At one point, a building that was 10 stories high started to fall over, over as those in the streets ran for nearby cover. Earlier this year, there was a swarm of more than 270 earthquakes near Reno, Nevada. You know what else is in Reno, Nevada? Very, very close to Reno, Nevada, a, a volcanic field known as Steamboat Springs, which is located in the area. There's extensive geothermal activity in the area right now, including numerous hot springs, steam vents, and furnaces. Is that volcanic field starting to wake up? But as seismic activity increases all over the globe, is it, it is inevitable that the U.S. will experience great shaking as well. There are three supervolcanoes on the planet. One of them 
is in the Midwest. Should it blow, it could cover, the ash could cover all the way to the Mississippi River. In addition to natural disasters, our world is being troubled by wars, pestilences, famines, economic problems, and political turmoil. A period of great chaos has arrived, and I'm entirely convinced that the pace of events will accelerate even more during the months ahead. And I believe that these signs are definitely pointing us to Christ coming back. And I'll be honest with you, I'm expecting Him any moment. Every night when I pray, I pray for God to come back, for the Lord to come back. And it looks like there are signs that are definitely, and there's a first flash of our lights. It looks like and there's a second flash. It looks like there's definitely signs for His coming back. Let's go on to this last thing in the news, under technology. Experts warned of digital enslavement as Amazon expands palm scan payments. E-commerce giant Amazon has just launched new tech that makes it far easier to sign up for its palm scanning payment service, sparking renewed concerns among privacy experts. With some warning, it's another pebble in the growing rock pile of tech giant's goal of digitized enslavement. It's Amazon One biometric payment service sign up is, can happen by taking a photo of your hand and uploading it to Amazon servers. Just a photo of your hand. Now they can sign up for Amazon One from home, at work, or on the go. The benefit for users, according to Amazon, is convenience. Amazon palm scanners are found in numerous retail locations across the country and have used, been used over 8 million times so far. So Amazon is making it easier to harvest more personal data that could potentially be exploited as part of a tech-enabled system of social surveillance and control. It goes hand in hand with the arc like first read you. Digital cattle. James Lindsay, founder of the New Discourses and author of several books, including Race, Marxism, and Social Injustice, told the Epoch Times, fresh evidence of a broader push towards tech-enabled digital enslavement is here. Mr. Lindsay said, they are pushing the digital slave ID really hard. And I, he said, I will not be a digital cattle. He explained, evil technocrats overlook people's humanity and see consumers as little more than domesticated animals to be milked for profit and tapped for other uses. The oligarchs need enough information to know what their cattle need to keep functioning, but also tons of information to know how to control and contour them into the ideal subjects and consumers, their systems, a need to sustain itself, he said. What's he talking about? He's talking about herding all of, all of the world people into one digital, digital tech giant's uh, control. Not just necessarily one digital tech giant, but one system run by t digital tech, di tech giants. Mr. Lindsay said this network of digital me mechanism and social control would be stacked against users. So you don't fly, you don't travel, you eat bugs and lentils, you turn, it, you turn in your neighbors, you watch propaganda, you take the data harvesting quizzes or play the data harvesting games, etc. And you get special bonus credits above a basic allotment that you can sell for perks, he wrote. So we're watching this digital thing come very, very close. The threat of com complete digital enslavement will come via offers of convenience and inclusion. Amazon's palm scanning app is a step in the direction of digi worldwide digital identity. He represents the closing of the totalitarian circle. My friends, we are very, very close. That's in the news for tonight. We're going